Welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consultant Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies prior to and following COVID-19 from the perspectives of founders, CEOs and other senior executives who are working on development of transformative life-saving solutions for patients. My guest today is Mr. Andrew Saz, co-founder and CEO of Evolve, an emerging life science company that develops artificial intelligence or AI engineered with life science data to accelerate how healing biological therapies reach those in need. Andrew holds a BA in economics and an MS in data science from Columbia University. His diverse experiences across multiple industries provides him with a very unique uh, perspective as a biotech CEO. Andrew and I actually connected on LinkedIn after he read an article that I had written as an editorial advisory board member for Cell and Gene titled, Role of Technology in Improving Reputation of the Life Sciences. In all of our conversations since then, I've been blown away by his passion for using AI to advance and modernize the life science industry. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thanks so much for having me, Sophia. It's an absolute pleasure. So yeah. my favorite question is always going to be my number one question is I want to know from you, what is your definition of scientific innovation? Oh, wow. Um, so um, to me, innovation has a lot to do with skepticism, hmm. right? Um, uh, I think innovation comes with being skeptical about skepticism. Hmm. Um, and the idea is that you know, especially in the, in the industries where you're like, like pharma and biotech, where it's full of skeptics I mean, and rightfully so, right? I mean, scientists and, and doctors are the, probably some of the most skeptical people on the planet. And so, um, and if we really want to push innovation forward, I think we have to also be questioning whether what we're, what we're doing, what we're seeing is actually the, the path forward. There's this really interesting story around uh, flies and bees. So the, the, there's this experiment that was done that they took uh, six flies and six bees and put them in a bottle, a glass bottle, and, and uh, placed the bottom of the bottle against the window, mm. right, a, a, on a sunny day. Mm. The, the, the bees, which are smarter, obviously, than flies, because they just would bang against the bottom of the glass because they think that the light is the way that you get out of things. And mm. the, fleas, uh, the flies just sort of like, you know, fly hither and thither, Ex exit the top of the bottle because they're not following the rules of like what they know, like mm -hmm. they just sort of based upon ignorance. And mm -hmm. I think sort of this sort of talks a little bit about skeptical about skepticism because we're just going to keep trying to go down the same pathway because we think that's the right way. And so innovation is sort of oftentimes either comes from the either being skeptical about skepticism so you can just try another direction or mm -hmm. just coming from this, this space of ignorance. So I think sometimes that sort of having that broad knowledge. And then the other way I think really innovation comes about is this blending of ideas, right? Um, and not creating a framework by which we have to follow a particular path where you just have these, you know, people who don't, you know, have very, very different knowledge bases. They come together and they're like, oh, wow, I just learned about something. And it comes through that the lens that I know things about from not me personally. But, you know. Well, I, I mean, I'm, this is why I said I was blown away by the conversations we've had. I, I wrote that down. Innovation comes from being skeptical about skepticism. I think that that is very powerful, very well said. And now that we've said that, I want to know just out of absolute curiosity, what is your most notable accomplishment pre-CEO? Oh. Um, <laughs> so I don't actually like... Pre-CEO, I actually, when people ask me this question, I'm like, can you just ask me that on my deathbed and I can tell you that? Because <laughs> um, then I could actually answer that question. I mean, you know, in my life, I've like, I've tried a bunch of different things. I've been like a lot, I've had a lot of different roles. And I think um, for me, I think my overall accomplishment and it still guides my, my, how I behave as sort of a, a leader in an organization is the desire to really help and serve others. Hmm. Um, and so... I would look at even some of the minor accomplishments I had, like when I was a waiter and like I like made someone feel really great by just solving a problem that they had. Or when I was in the insurance industry and I was able to keep people from getting hurt or show that, you know, like 
because I don't know how that, you know, I, I can't, you can't really see the consequences of your actions. Right. Um, and so like, or, you know, uh, just helping people feel free or healed. I, I think one of the things like more recently that sort of stood out to me was that um, I have a particular charity that like I, I try to give money to and bringing people's attention to it. Uh, that was really impactful to me. And the reason it's impactful, I think it was impactful is because if I can actually just bring one person's attention to that charity, it actually can have a very, very long-term effect because I donate my money to a, an organization that helps children that, that are removed from their homes by the, by the courts because, you know, there may be drugs in the house or violence in the house or things like that. So this organization actually provides a, a, a safe place for these children mm -hmm. who, uh, and it's specifically like in my area where I'm from, which is South Florida. Mm -hmm. And so by bringing people a, a, attention to that, I think about like the long-term consequences that that could have. Like, you know, if every dollar that goes into that institution is basically helping someone get some, get help a younger person getting education, getting a, a, a safe place to be. And so this is that, that sort of long-term effect. So I don't actually know like the consequences that I have, right. but I'm just sort of saying like, can we impact, if I can impact one person. And for me, like being a biotech CEO is like, if I can help one person's life, that's enough for me, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I know that like, if we can help one person, we're gonna help a lot of people. So that for me is, uh, it's just been a driving force. So uh, in just the way that I, I've lived my life. So I don't know, it's sort of a hard question for me to be able to you know, pin down. No, I think you, you, you actually answered it very well. Now I'm sure many people will be curious to know what charity it is. And if you don't mind sharing that information for those that might want to support that charity. Yeah, it's called His House Children's Home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Miami base. It's based in South Florida. In fact, um, when the uh, the earthquake happened in Haiti, they actually went over to help the children that had lost their parents or don't have didn't have anywhere to go. Then they brought them here and actually made it easier for children to be adopted. They uh, lead. Uh, they help like manage all the foster care, a significant portion of the foster care in South Florida. They actually make it free to adopt in South mm -hmm. Florida. So mm -hmm. like if someone wants to adopt it, they, they do, they do a lot of really good. And they also have uh, group homes for mm -hmm. those, you know, because oftentimes when children are older, it's mm -hmm. very, you know, they they don't, they're less likely to be adopted. And so they provide group homes and have like a parent in the home. And it's a very challenge. It's, I mean, it's a challenge, right? So, you know, you think about the children who are with the positions that they were in to the fact that the, the courts actually came in and removed the children from the home, you know, like, it's not every case, but like a lot of those cases, those children are going to be suffering from a lot of the anxiety and fear that comes along with that. And that has those the uh, impacts on their mental wellness. And so mm -hmm. to me, that, that organization is very impactful. And mm -hmm. I don't really, I like, I'm always concerned where my money's going when I'm donating mm -hmm. to an organization, but I actually can see where it's going. Like I know what it's doing. I know who it's impacting. I can see the impact on the children that are there. And so that's why I, uh, but thank you so much for asking me about the- Oh the, yeah. So his house children's home, that sounds yeah. really exemplary. And again, this is one of the reasons why I was very delighted to speak with you today. And, and now what I would love to hear from you, it's like a top line overview of innovation that is going on within your company, especially as it relates to maybe immunotherapy or even anti-infectives. We'd love to hear more from you from that perspective. Yes, for sure. So um, because um, my co-founder and I actually don't come from a, like a biology or life science background, we actually come from an engineering perspective. Mm -hmm. And so scientists and engineers actually face problems in very different ways. So mm -hmm. scientists sort of reduce problems to their simplest form to get a very sort of controlled environment. But engineers take uh, view things in terms of like irreducible complexity, right? We have to look at the entire system. So even, you know, these are very different ways of, of approaching challenges, uh, you know, and so we try to kind of marry those methodologies by saying, okay, we understand that this is an irreducibly complex system. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we've done in, in our, in ways that we innovate is that uh, because you could look at binding and affinity as sort of the first thing that is tested when you're looking at immunotherapies. It's often the very first thing that's tested in a laboratory, right? right? But we actually stepped back mm. a st one step because, you know, especially in immunization, the, the system that's being interacted with is an evolutionary system, right? It's generated mm -hmm. over the millennia. And mm -hmm. so we try to model evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you, which is basically what's happening when, you know, with, with affinity maturation or BDJ recombination. And mm -hmm. so, 
we modeled evolution, and then we applied the system pressures, which is the control, the experimental controls that a scientific scientists do. You know, when we first started doing this, we had like 15 ex, like in silico assays, right? And instead of like an in vitro assay, we're doing in silico assays. So we started, we had 15 and then had 80. And just this week, we actually uh, increased up to 200 tests. Hmm. So what that's doing is, is you think about that from the evolutionary perspective, from evolution, it's like, you know, if you, if, you know, your child, your child's not going to be born with blue hair. It might be born with blonde hair or brown hair or black hair, right? But it's not going to be born with blue hair. They might change into blue hair as their life goes along. But it's not going to be born with blue hair. So right. that's sort of like saying, like, what's evolutionarily possible? Mm. But then we sort of add the, the stressor constraints. So think about, like, thermostability at uh, 98 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Why mm. is that important? Because if, you, if it's not thermostable at those temperatures, it's not, you're going to inject it into a human body. It's going you know, to become unstable. So mm. these are the types of things that we're analyzing. And why we're doing this is really trying to think about the different uh, stages of the pharma value chain. And mm. can we computationally do this? Now, we're doing this process in the span of a 12 hours, mm -hmm. right? So all this is happening, generating and screening is happening in, in span of 12 hours. And then we're checking computational binding. Um, and that takes a little bit longer because it's a very sort of a complex process and computation intensive process. So the innovation that we're doing is really talking about failing as much as possible in mm. the computer mm. Mm. so that we don't get those, we start to bring down the failure rate. You know, pharma has a 90% failure rate, right? Yeah. If you talk about like from drug discovery to the doctor's office, right. there, there's this 90% failure rate. So can we bring that down, right? Make it 88%, make it mm -hmm. 85%. And just by keeping on, on adding these screeners in the computer so that once it gets to the lab, it's less likely to fail. Right. And, and it's cheap, way cheaper to fail the computer. It takes way less time. Right. And it's something that can be done really rapidly. And that's what we do. That's how we innovate uh, on our, but, but I, I'd like to say, I mean, our algorithms, they're focused, focused on biologics, which means we can do it for antibodies or mm -hmm. anything that's protein-based or amino acid-based. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's, broadly, it's broadly applicable. It doesn't necessarily have to be just for oncology or mm -hmm. um, which we were focused on oncology and autoimmune disorders. We, eat, we very quickly switched to infectious diseases for, you know, a, a, for a good reason. Right, right. <laughs> um, uh, but like, it's very easy for us to do. And in fact, we're working uh, with companies right now that are um, non-antibody based therapies as well as mm. not, not just therapeutics in the uh, immunotherapy space. We're also looking at plant-based therapies. So can we use our technology to create novel plants that can be potentially be therapeutics? Mm -hmm. So we're working on a bunch of different ways across a bunch of different spectrums. And we're fairly agnostic to the, uh, the disease space as long as it's bi biology related because we're looking at you know, gene therapy and, mm -hmm. and CAR-T, um, mm -hmm. As, as methodologies to you know, apply our technology. I think that, um, again, I'm just really blown away. I'm, and I'm gonna have to find a different phrase at this point because the wealth of information that you showcase, I'm a traditional medicinal chemist. And to have someone like you with your unique background, that's why I think we need more people like you in the industry because we should not accept failure rates. Nine out of 10 experiments, they fail. What can we do to improve the rate of drug discovery? And that will in turn reduce, as you alluded to, the cost of drugs and, and in, inherently will also help to shape the reputation of the industry at large. So right. now that we said all that, I would love to know, um, I, I believe Evolve is more of a virtual life science company, but I still want to find out how COVID-19 has changed the way that you approach work internally. So um, I've been working remotely for um, over 15 years. Mm. Um, I'm actually a big proponent of, of um, remote work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we first started our company, I used to tell people who joined our company, I don't care where you are, you can be mm -hmm. in Fiji, right? As long as you have an internet connection and you're getting what you need to get done, that's fine with me. Uh, I, you know, like people are adults, we don't need to, I don't think that like, if, if they don't need to, if they don't need to come to an office, they shouldn't have to come to an office. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that they, if they want to come, like there are some people who, who, who need that structure, right? right. Um, I think it's, I think, we, and I think we need to be flexible and I think it, it requires like thoughtful leadership. Mm -hmm. um, so from that perspective, we, we've had this practice in place um, and we're a technology company. So like, you know, you're, if you're working on a computer, where do you need to be? So one of the things actually we do is we really have best practices that we have for our team members. So 
we use Slack. We use it within Slack. There's this, um, this embedded app called donut, which like every week, everyone gets like a randomly assigned other person to meet with. Mm -hmm. Um, we do like lunches together online or dinners together online with those people who can, who can participate. But the reason that we think about this is that, you know, if you think about like uh, how people work, mm -hmm. so assuming you're going to an office every day, mm -hmm. I guess that you have about an hour commute each way, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. there's two hours of a day that's kind of wasted, mm -hmm. um, right? That could be better spent. Maybe you can focus that on, on work. Then by the time you get to the office, you spend like the first hour of the day, you know, making yourself coffee, getting sort of settled in. Mm -hmm. And then, you, you know, now it's 10 o'clock and maybe by 12, you're going to grab lunch. You got two hours of work in. Mm -hmm. And then so, and then the same thing happens after lunch. You get to sleepies after lunch. So maybe like your productivity goes down and then, you know, four o'clock rolls around and you're thinking about like, what are you going to make for dinner? Your commute home and then you're commuting home. And then, right. So like, we're literally, there are a lot of studies out there that show that people on average are productive about two to three hours on a given eight hour day. Wow. But you could think about like how much more productive we could be and how much more life we have, right? right? When we don't have to spend those two hours commuting, mm -hmm. when we have the freedom to spend time with our families or thinking mm -hmm. about the personal things that we need to do, mm -hmm. um, and then dedicating that time to being productive in the home or wherever it is that you want to work. And so it hasn't, COVID hasn't really changed the way that we operate our business. Mm -hmm. What it has changed is our ability to do business. Right. Right. The sales right. cycles are faster, mm -hmm. right? You have access to people more often. Mm -hmm. uh, decisions are being made more quickly because, you know, to get access to people is much faster. And there's mm -hmm. more time being spent working um, and less time spent traveling, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a salesperson, you don't have to fly anywhere anymore. You right. don't have to drive anywhere anymore. It's, it's, it makes things easier. Transaction and costs are, are dropping down. And there's so much positive effect on the environment as well, right? That's a, you know, I mean, planes not flying. I don't know if you, were, if you saw in February, mm -hmm. like there was a, um, a satellite image over China mm -hmm. that showed like the pollution drop, mm -hmm. right? In February, it was like, it was so impressive and amazing. And I was like, oh, this is actually really good. It could have good consequences. So you know, I'm a silver lining kind of guy. Anyway. <laughs> no, I am too. I, I do believe that there's always light at the end of the tunnel. And this is probably an opportunity for all of us to step back and say, what can we do differently? The beauty of Evolve is same is that you all have been sort of at the forefront of innovation. So that's really good to, to hear that. Now, it, it seems to me as well that corporate social responsibility is a priority just based on some of the things that you've mentioned so far. So have you been able to change your corporate social responsibility efforts as a result of the pandemic or is it still sort of business as usual it's business as usual but i mean when i but i mean like everything we do we always think about like the social responsibility of what we're doing like the whole like our 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 like mission vision statement mission statement is about accelerating the speed at which healing reaches those in need Mm -hmm. um, to us, that doesn't just mean those who are sick, right? And, you know, it, it also means the people who love them, right? Because when someone gets sick, it's not just that individual who's affected. It's all the people who care about them. And, people, and right. you know, you think about the monetary expense. But also, you know, when we're thinking about accelerating, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the two sides, accelerate and the people in need. But when we think about accelerating, mm -hmm. you know, we think about like the cost of making chemicals, right? That has mm -hmm. an environmental cost. We think right. about the cost of animals, right? So like if we can start to model, computationally model animal studies, mm -hmm. we're starting to be more humanitarian and like killing less animals. And yeah. in fact, if you think about like if we're sort of not, I don't want to call it replacing, but let's say augmenting mm -hmm. the discovery process of immunization, these mm -hmm. are animals that won't have to be injected or potentially euthanized to be able to collect their, their immune response. So now right. we may be able to do that. So, and then in addition, in clinical trials, as we start to move down the value chain and develop more and more technology, you know, if we're optimizing these clinical trials for patient design, if we're doing, we're testing on less individuals, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that good? Well, so in one sense, if you do, especially for adaptive clinical trials, if you're testing on less patients, Mm -hmm. you're meaning that the, the drug is going to get to market faster. But in the same time, especially if you're doing placebo controlled trials, right. Right, there's a whole group of people that may not be receiving your, your therapy that, that, you know, assuming that the therapy is good, right? right? Like that, that's a sort of, a, now we're reducing that number of patients who are not potentially not getting the treatment or if the treatment is unsafe that are also not getting the un, you know, the new treatment that might be unsafe. So mm -hmm. by doing so, we really think about the, like the responsibility we have to 
uh, the environment, to uh, the animal population, to the human population, and then those people who actually need the treatment. Can we get it there faster as well as less expensive, which translate in, translates into you know, less expensive drugs because right. you know, we're shortening the time it takes, which means right. you've got a longer patent life, which means you can distribute that cost of developing those drugs over those patent years, which means you lower the cost. We lower the burden on society from the, the healthcare costs. There's a lot of things that we do that are really driven by corporate social responsibility. So it hasn't changed too much. Right. right. Um, and we keep trying to embed more. That's all right. we're trying to do, like try to embed more. But we've been doing that from the beginning. So. Right. But again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It seems like Evolve is at the forefront of innovation because part of the reason why your company was created is to reduce some of those inefficiencies. And that by itself, it's a corporate social respons responsibility effort. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, my next question would be, what do you think will be some key consideration factors that will be important for sustaining innovation in the life science industry? Um, I think um, it, it's about bringing together disparate thinking. Mm -hmm. right? If, uh, trying not to keep things so siloed. Um, yeah. There was a really great article that came out of Life Science Leader a few uh, back, I think it was in December, where the CEO of uh, GenMab was uh, interviewed, Jan van der Winkle. Yes. It's actually a really impressive uh, article, but what he talked about was how when they built their new, um, their new building, mm -hmm. that they really tried to make it an open environment. And mm. right, and and didn't keep like the scientific labs in the in the basement, right? Like they really tried to mix things up. And why that's great is because you know you need to have those business development people potentially talking to the laboratory discovery individuals because those business development individuals are sitting in front of the customers, right? And well, they're sitting in front of the doctors who the doctors are sitting in front of the customers, right? The patient is the customer. Right, so like, but they're sitting into the people who actually make decisions about what the what your, the patients are getting, and that really should be funneled back to those laboratory scientists. But if you're not having, but un, but unless it's, oftentimes those are in very structured meetings, but having that sort of ability to have those disparate views meeting randomly is actually a way that pushes forward innovation. You know, keeping somebody in a basement in a corner, mm -hmm. it right, doesn't offer allow the opportunity for those very, very different thought processes. Mm -hmm. And it's why I'm a very big advocate for diversity, right? Not just diversity of thought, but diversity of age and sex and uh, sexual orientation and experience and, and you know, knowledge and everything, because right. it's important because those different views are what create that innovative thinking. Right. Um, and so, um, I think that one way that biotech can really do that is, is perhaps like, you know, there's, you know, there's always the view of like, you need to have a postdoc, you need to have a PhD. And it's actually been a challenge for us as a company because I have a master's degree, right? That's as far as I went on my education. Right. Um, and so, you know, I don't think it's true for everybody, by the way. I think that, the, but there is a subset of, of views that says like, if you don't have this education, you're not qualified to be in our industry or qualified to do certain things. And I think that oftentimes there's a value to be had for um, the, the, the inexperience. So even if you're a PhD postdoc researcher in a lab and you're talking to a PhD business development person, they each have their own lack of information and that, that synergy helps create this innovative mindset. Right, right. Yeah. right. I mean, we've talked about this before, about the summit collaborating for noble solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think that the whole idea for this summit is to bring together those diverse uh, thinking, bring people together that come from different backgrounds. So you definitely hit the nail on the head. I think that that will be the future of innovation, collaboration. Um, so now, this question, you can answer it any way you, you feel. Uh, is there any technology or company that you're currently excited about, including yours, and, and why? Well, I mean, obviously ours. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I jump out of bed every morning because uh, I'm super excited to do everything that we're doing. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, you know, being in the in the sort of the intersection of AI and and, mm -hmm. and life sciences, mm -hmm. we're really sitting at the like as a company, we're sort of sitting at the edge of innovation, right? You know, mm -hmm. you could talk about like space travel being the edge of innovation, and talking about like life sciences and and, and medicine being like the edge of innovation, where we where we're putting AI together with that. Um, so there's a lot of companies doing some really really amazing work. 
Um, but you know, I've read tons of papers all the time and I'm just blown away. I think to me more than anything, like the things that are going to really be transformative is um, the applications of some of these really smart devices mm. um, into the next wave of humanity. So we're talking about like, I really am interested in sort of like cyber, like the, the cyber human, right? Mm. Where we start to see the intersection. And I mean, I, you could look at like Neuralink as, as one of those, as, as kind of like a, a really uh, innovative uh, company in that, um, in, in doing something like that. I'm really, uh, cause I remember when the whole wearables thing was coming out, right? Mm. I was like, oh, that was so cool. Wearables are cool. But I was like, when is somebody gonna do embeddables? Right. Like we're already doing like knee implants and, you know, like breast implants and right. Like and uh, uh, putting devices inside of our bodies. I'm really curious when we're going to start seeing those become Internet connected devices. Mm. Right. And and when are we going to have those Internet connected devices that are going to be like constant diagnosis? Right. Yeah. So like if you think about like the liquid biopsy companies, can we put some a device into our body that will constantly like check for like, do we have cancer? Or do we have some other disease, some infectious disease? Right. Um, I'm also really, really encouraged by the um, the innovation for um, helping uh, um, uplift society. Mm -hmm. So um, whether it's education distributed to the masses or low, low cost medicine mm -hmm. for uh, third world countries or countries that have like you know, water, because water is sort of like the biggest cause of disease, mm -hmm. right? One of the biggest causes of diseases in the, in, the, in the world, like where there's water issues. And so like, I'm really encouraged by some of the, the work being done um, out of the Gates Foundation to help that, but also like the companies that the Gates Foundation supports, right? Not just, you know, I think about like what the impact of it is. Um, so I'm really encouraged by the promise of, the, of tomorrow. And I think that that's one of the, the, um, the, the, the goal, you know, like you said, the light at the end of the tunnel, or for me, the silver lining of the coronavirus, we're going to start realizing that we can't ignore the infectious diseases that are coming out of different countries, because they're, they're global, they have a, could have a global impact. And so I'm really hopeful that we'll see uh, innovation moving back towards infectious disease, because historically, it hasn't been, like in the past several years, it hasn't been a lot of investment in it, because the markets that they're targeting are like not wealthy markets, right? right? right. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that we'll start to, that the, that, the, that the, I hope is like a TSA or Department of Homeland Security response, level of response that we're gonna see to this epidemic will actually be worldwide and really help the global, help, the, help global society. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if that answered the question, but you know. Yes, you did. I, I was born in Nigeria, as you know, and infectious disease has always been very close to my heart. I believe every 45 seconds or so in Africa, a child dies from malaria. And if there's anything that COVID-19 has brought to the forefront is that we cannot ignore infectious diseases. I mean, look at the impact that it has on a global scale. So that was extremely well said. Now, let's talk philosophy for a little bit. Um, how would you advise for a brand new biotech CEO coming into uh, the office today be different today versus, you know, before COVID-19? Well, I'm not, a, I don't consider myself a biotech CEO. So I would be, I would be hard pressed to like, from experience wise, I'm more, I consider myself a SciTech CEO. So like in, intersection of science and technology. So, um, um, so like biotech, you know, the business of, of pharmaceuticals and, and, and right. Uh, but I think of ourselves as more SciTech. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but um, I, I would say this is sort of like general guidance that I give to most entrepreneurs. Um, not like maybe, and, and if I'm thinking about like, maybe not from the CEO perspective, but from the founder perspective, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you're mission driven by money and that's your mission, right? Your mission is to wake up every day and make more money. That's an okay mission to have. Like don't, no one should short that, short sell that. But is, but um, I find myself hard pressed to say, this is the m reason that I get up. You know, you're going to get, a, as, as a founder, you're going to get a thousand rejections hmm. before you get it before you get a yes right mm -hmm. and you have to understand like one has to, you may not get a thousand but you have to go in thinking that and so and and in, in the pharma and life science space you know the failure rate think about it you're going to get a thousand failures before you get one success right so is what is it that is go what is it that makes you want to do this every single day right 
is it the disease that you're focused on, right? Because maybe someone that you love has the disease. What is it that drives your mission? Mm -hmm. Because to me, that's what's going to make someone jump out of bed. We have to work tirelessly as, ex as executives. Like I work, you know, 16 hours a day and I only take time off just so that I can recharge so that I can work 16 hours a day. Right. right? That's the only reason I take the time for myself. And, um, the other thing that I would say that's really important is to really think deeply about um, leadership, hmm. your leadership style, mm -hmm. like how you want to lead, hmm. how you want to manage, which is a hmm. different thing, hmm. and the culture that you want to build. Hmm. Because when people join an organization, they're, you know, they're obviously exchanging their time for money. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of choices, especially in an industry like our, like the biotech and you know, life science industry, where there are a lot of companies still hiring, right? Still hiring and keeping, and we'll keep hiring. Are, are, we're less impacted by, the, by COVID than all, uh, lots of other industries. Right. And they have other options. So your culture and your leadership style and your management style is actually going to impact whether or not people want to be there. Because people don't, you know, people are less interested in the how they're working somewhere than they are in the why they're working somewhere. Right, right. And I think that it's important to remember that Mm -hmm. um, as one comes and takes on that sort of role. Um, and so hopefully that's helpful. Very. Remember oh, the why. Yeah, oh, the, other, the other thing that I would say, the other piece of advice I'd say is actually, I highly recommend reading this book, ah. Search of Excellence, an incredible book. It actually talks about, you know, what makes great companies great. It was written in the 80s, but it's, a, it's, it's relevant even to today. So. Right. I think there are always going to be some fundamental principles that will carry on from decade to decade. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. And uh, now I'll give you the floor for any sort of final words, thoughts, or commentaries. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, um, I actually, I, I, you know, in terms of commentary, I mean, the thoughts, you know, we're an AI company. We're really, really good at AI. And, you know, the, the pharma industry is sort of fractured in its, in its, in its knowledge, right? So some people are very good at doing antibody discovery. Others are really good at animal studies. Others are really good at setting up clinical trials. You know, there's, it's a sort of a, a disparate industry. And so, but I think that that unification is what allow, you know, that as a biotech company is right. You don't have to have a lab, right? You can, you can outsource that. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say, and I think that there's like a shortage of companies that can actually provide that uh, support to mm -hmm. organizations around technology, AI, um, and I just wanted to let people know that they're, they're interested, especially because we focus on biologics. There are a lot of companies that do small molecules, but if we can provide that support to help collaborate and really accelerate the speed at which uh, whatever type of, uh, of uh, disease you're working on, that we can help those ind individuals and support that process, reduce that failure rate, we're, we are absolutely excited to, to collaborate on, on this. And, uh, and, and that would be something we'd love to to talk to more people about, explain sort of how we do things and how we can help support their mission. Oh, that's great. And thank you for sharing that. I think my favorite quote from you today is that uh, innovation comes from being skeptical about skepticism. I think that that's really powerful. You should probably get a trademark on that. Very <laughs> so. I'll, I'll, I'll let, you know, you can, I let people steal it. Anybody can have it. Anybody can have it. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for the time today. It's been an absolute pleasure just hearing from you. And, and you make me personally very excited about the future of our industry, whether it's a SciTech, biotech, life science, whatever it is that we call it, we're all in this together to you know, basically improve people's lives all over the world, not just here in the US. So thank you for a great session. Thank you so much, Sophia. And thanks so much for inviting me. I love, I've enjoyed every single one of our conversations. I'm looking forward to many, many more. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. Have a good one, Andrew. Bye-bye. All right, bye.